Think Forward. Think Research Channel. The opinions expressed in the following program are strictly those of the speaker. They do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. From the National Science Foundation, where discoveries begin, this is Frontier, discussions of today's most exciting research subjects by distinguished scientists and engineers working at the frontiers of knowledge. I'm Michael Reichman. I'm a deputy assistant director for engineering here at the National Science Foundation. It's my pleasure to, this afternoon to welcome you on behalf of both the Office of Legislative and Public Affairs, lovingly called OPA, <laughs> and the director for engineering, lovingly called the sponsor in a lot of these cases. <clears throat> anyway, I want to thank you and I want to uh, welcome you and thanks for being here. Our speakers today are going to talk about engineering research and the foundation it forms for the well-being of the nation's infrastructure. They're going to focus on the built infrastructure, that is bridges, tunnels, highways, buildings, the things that really form the lifeline and the circulatory system of the nation, of its economy and of just our daily life. Engineers have for a long time now paid close attention to those issues of the built infrastructure. And we at National Science Foundation and Engineering have supported a lot of basic research over the years in innovative designs, in materials, in processes, and all the things that contribute. The research that we sponsor is really crucial to maintaining our existing structures, making structures a little bit more resilient in the future, and also the building of, of new structures. For example, over the past uh, 20 years probably, the directorate has funded a, a lot of fundamental research in isolation systems. We've got a lot of buildings out there now that are very susceptible to damage from different kinds of events, uh, one being hurricanes, one being earthquakes. These buildings are constructed a long time before we had hard earthquake codes. And they really, the isolation systems that we're doing research on are the isolation systems that will allow them to be resilient in the modern sense and act like new buildings. In a similar way, we've sponsored for the last few years work on sensor systems. Sensors that are designed really to monitor the health of bridges in particular. These systems are, permit our engineers then to look at the safety record of a bridge either before, during, or after some sort of a cataclysmic event. And that research continues and is really uh, very much in the making for having a big impact at this time. Matter of fact, our third speaker today, Dr. Nanny, will speak to that issue. And speaking of bridges, who can really forget in this near term the collapse of the I-35 bridge in Minneapolis this last August? It's left us with a whole bunch of questions. And they're questions that, is this bridge typical of the entire infrastructure of the nation? You've certainly seen a lot in the press about the even national money that's being expended, additional national money is being expended now to take a hard look at a lot of the other infrastructure in the nation to see if indeed we're on a failure course for many structures. Our speakers today are going to present us a, a pool of knowledge that will help us in answering some of those questions. I think it will also provide us a little bit of a forward look on where that knowledge where the future innovation that's based on that knowledge, and where the educational process that we hope educates all those new, fresh, young engineers, 
where that will help us meet the challenges that those aging structures present to us. First of all, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Richard Sauss. Dr. Sauss is a professor of structural engineering and director of the Advanced Technology for Large Structural Systems Center at Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. It's interesting to note that this center started in 1986, by my count, 21 years ago. And it started life as in the, actually the second generation, I guess the first generation of engineering research centers. A very novel but very, very comprehensive idea on how to bring different disciplines together to focus in on particular research areas. Those research centers have been an enormous success in this nation. We're now into our third generation of those centers and looking for tremendous successes in the future. But he was one of the first class, and you can see what has happened because of the NSF investment from 20 years ago. Also, in addition to being director of that center, Dr. Sauce is the co-director of the Pennsylvania Infrastructure Technology Alliance. Today, he's going to talk to us about life cycles of bridges. Dr. Sauce. Well, thank you, Dr. Reichman. Um, I want to start by thanking NSF for the opportunity to participate today um, and give you a brief sense of the purpose of my presentation. Uh, today I'll be talking about um, providing an overview of the problem of deficient bridges, uh, provide some examples of, about how past research has paid off, and to suggest how increased research investment would impact the problem. And to be fair, uh, we should start out by saying that uh, most of the bridges, most of the 600,000 bridges in the country are in good condition. Uh, however, the injuries and the loss of life uh, from the tragic failure of the I-35W bridge in, Min in Minneapolis um, has raised uh, greater attention uh, to the problem of deficient bridges in the country. Bridges that are not in acceptable condition are classified as either structurally deficient or functionally obsolete in the National Bridge Inventory. A structurally deficient bridge, uh, indicated here by the photo on the left, uh, has one or more structural components that are sufficiently deteriorated that, so that some limit on either vehicle speed or vehicle weight is likely to be needed. Uh, functionally obsolete bridges, uh, illustrated here by the photo on the right, uh, is a bridge whose geometry doesn't accommodate uh, the current width, length, height of, 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 of volumes uh, according to current design standards. And as you can see here, according to the National Bridge Inventory, 12% uh, of our bridges are structurally deficient um, and 13% are functionally obsolete. So uh, in a sense, one in four bridges is deficient in some way. Uh, these national figures tend to overgeneralize the problem. Uh, in fact, in some states, as many as 40% of the bridges are uh, structurally, obsolete, structurally deficient or functionally obsolete. In other states, it's as little as 15% or less. And in our urban areas, more than 30% of the bridges fall in these categories. Uh, we um, know that these deficiency rates then at, at a national level are just kind of providing an overview and uh, may not be specific to any particular region. Uh, but they do provide a sense of the trend and um, what, kind of, uh, evaluate, what kind of benchmarks we can evaluate against. Uh, and the data shows that some progress is being made, but the progress is very slow. Uh, currently, the percentage of highway bridges that's either structurally deficient or functionally obsolete uh, decreases by about one-half of one percent uh, per year. So at our current rates of uh, all else being the same, it would take uh, 20 years to even get down to 15 percent deficiency rates. Uh, the improvement that we do see comes from uh, two things. We do replace and repair bridges at a faster rate than others become deficient. Uh, and we're building new bridges, as you can see. So the total number seems to be, to be growing, uh, about um, 2,000 bridges or so per year. Uh, an important consideration in the discussion of, uh, critical br of bridges is how critical they are uh, to our social and economic activities. In the five Hudson River uh, crossings in the New York C City metropolitan area, uh, as um, illustrated by the Verrazano Bridge here, to provide a really compelling example for us to focus on. On the east side of the river, there's about 10 million people, and virtually everything they uh, buy to eat 
or to wear our clothing or to consume in any other way uh, crosses these five crossings from west to east by truck. Um, so all of that economic activity is dependent on these crossings. In addition, uh, there's about a, many hundreds of thousands of people that cross these bridges each day as commuters. And so we can imagine the uh, social and economic impact of even a short-term uh, closure of one of these bridges for, say, a few weeks, um, and it would be very significant. So another example would be uh, the damage to the San Francisco-Oakland uh, Bay Bridge uh, in the 1989 earthquake in Loma Prieta. Uh, this provided an ex a real example of the social and economic disruption, just as we're seeing now in, in Minneapolis from the uh, loss of the I-35 um, West Bridge in, in uh, Minneapolis. Uh, around the country, there's numerous other uh, critical bridges like this, large bridges that carry more than 100,000 people per day uh, with no viable alternate routes, um, and these exist in all of our major metropolitan regions. And at the same time across the country, we see that there's a lot of small bridges that small communities rely on. That's their critical bridges. So this is really a, a problem with a, a national scope, not just confined to large metropolitan regions. The critical bridges that we have are threatened by deterioration, uh, typically from environmental and traffic conditions both. Uh, some examples are shown here. We have corrosion uh, of reinforced concrete structures, uh, corrosion of steel structures. Typically, this is from de-icing salts that are used on the highway in the wintertime. Um, in addition, we have other examples like fatigue, which would be uh, caused by uh, truck loading or thermal cycles, daily thermal cycles, or even occasionally brittle fracture, uh, as shown here, which is from a, a poorly designed or poorly fabricated detail where that uh, stiffener plate in that example is attached. And as we know, critical bridges are also threatened by extreme events, uh, such as hurricanes, uh, earthquakes, uh, impact from uh, waterborne vessels underneath the bridge or overheight vehicles. And they're also threatened by fire and blast loading as well. As we consider the problem of um, deficient bridges in the country, now we should be aware that our nation has a very strong bridge research community. And these photos provide a few examples of recent research projects, either in the laboratory or in the field uh, conducted at Lehigh University. In order to use the limited resources that we have to address the problem of deficient bridges, research to develop advanced science and technology uh, related to bridges um, should be an important part of our approach. Some examples of past successes, positive impacts and contributions made by previous research um, are shown in the next couple slides. Uh, this example is from research on uh, steel bridge fatigue. And through a uh, uh, number of fundamental studies and more basic uh, research, as well as applied research, uh, details were developed that have essentially eliminated uh, the problem of fatigue from modern steel bridges. And the detail we're talking about is something like this, where a plate is transitioned abruptly rather than um, more gradually. And there are numerous details like this in steel bridges that have been improved by uh, past research. Uh, more recently, in the 1990s, research has developed so-called high-performance materials for bridges. These include high-performance steels, high-performance concrete, and fiber composite materials. Uh, these um, materials have made our bridges that are being constructed now uh, more durable and more robust against damage, uh, and also, uh, in some ways, more resistant against uh, attack from extreme events. So as a result of past research, uh, compared to bridges constructed 40 years ago, bridges today are more durable and more robust and damage resistant. In addition, they're more resistant to uh, earthquakes uh, as a result of, the, for example, the National uh, Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program here at NSF and at other federal agencies. But we have to keep in mind that most of the bridges out there were constructed before a lot of these important research results uh, were available. Uh, we find that a majority of bridges, or a large uh, fraction of our bridges, were from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, the average age of our bridges is about 40 years. Uh, and this means that the inventory has about half the bridges that are not particularly durable, uh, not damage resistant, and not resistant to extreme events. There's a large inventory out there of older bridges. And these bridges will require uh, extensive maintenance uh, over time, and may eventually join that list of deficient bridges that we mentioned earlier. Uh, as we continue to build and rebuild highway bridges, the combined federal, state, uh, and local spending is about $9 billion per year, and that's quite a bit of money. 
but as noted previously, the progress on the deficient bridge problem is rather slow. Um, at the same time, we're spending quite a modest amount on bridge research um, that we really need to address this problem more efficiently. Uh, my rough estimate of our current research expenditures are of the order of one half of one percent of the nine billion dollars, or something maybe approximately fifty million dollars a year. Uh, and it appears that this is really not enough. So as we focus on the problem of deficient bridges, we really ought to consider spending uh, much more to develop the knowledge base and the advanced technology we need to solve the problem. Now, our current research needs are actually fairly clear. Uh, for replacement bridges, we need advanced technology for rapid bridge construction. We need that to reduce the time for which uh, traffic patterns, exi existing traffic patterns are disrupted. We need durable bridge technology so that the bridges we build today won't be the next generation of defic deficient bridges 30 or 40 years from now. And we need replacement bridges that are economical. Uh, to sustain existing bridges, we need rapid durable repair technology. We need better technology for inspecting and monitoring bridges. And we need management systems that will more efficiently use the resources that we have for inspecting, maintaining, and repairing bridges. Our research programs need to have a, a balance between applied research uh, that addresses immediate needs and research that's more fundamental in nature. A recent research through the National Cooperative Highway Research Program, the US DOT, and the many state DOTs tend to emphasize immediate research needs. Uh, these programs are often directed by the bridge owners and bridge engineers in practice today. Uh, they fulfill important needs, uh, but they only incrementally advance the practice of building and maintaining bridges. Little funding has been available uh, through programs such as those that might be directed by the National Science Foundation for sustained and fundamental research that could, provi could provide the deeper knowledge uh, and the breakthrough technologies that we need. So as we consider uh, increasing our investment in research, especially in the area of infrastructure, we should see that the research programs are balanced between applied research and fundamental research. Essentially, we need innovation in order to get past the problem of an aging infrastructure. And finally, we should be considering the next generation of bridge engineers. Uh, the State Departments of Transportation and the consulting engineering firms across the country are in need of well-educated bridge engineers. Um, there are a lot of places where these institutions are understaffed. Uh, students who participate in research at universities uh, in parallel with their coursework become the highly, highly qualified engineers that we need uh, to solve the problems of an aging infrastructure. Federally funded research programs that emphasize both training of students uh, and research accomplishments will provide both the next generation of bridge engineers and the research results that we need. So uh, again, I thank you for the opportunity to participate today, uh, and I'll turn it back to Dr. Reichman. An outstanding start, Dr. Sauce. Thank you very much. Um, next, let me introduce Toshiro Okazaki. Um, he is a, currently an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota in their Department of Civil Engineering. His primary research interests are in the design and detailing of, of large-scale steel structures. He recently obtained a grant from NSF to look at the data or, com or compile and examine the data associated with the recent collapse of the I-35 bridge in Minneapolis. And, and let me say a word about that grant, as a matter of fact. That, the grant is part of a program that we do here at the National Science Foundation that we reserve uh, to some extent for immediate response to events like this or other, other uh, for forces of nature you don't expect uh, these awards are really kind of a key to quickly responding and giving researchers the funding that's necessary to collect data in an extreme environment in areas where the data is perishable and where it has uh, it's deteriorated really quickly with time. Now, for example, five years ago when we had Katrina, uh, within just a matter of a few days, we had 16 small grants for exploratory research in place to examine the perishable data that existed 
Um, it, it's a mechanism we use in cases like this that I think is, is very helpful. Be that as it may, today uh, Dr. Okazaki will speak to us on preliminary information he's been able to sort out from uh, his investigation thus far about that particular bridge collapse in Minneapolis. Thank you very much for the introduction, Dr. Reitman. Uh, my name is my name is Taichiro Kozaki. I'm at the University of Minnesota. I will be talking briefly about what we know about the I-35 bridge um, at this point. On Wednesday, August the 1st, this year, we had a very unfortunate tragedy in Minnesota. At 6.05 p.m. that day, the bridge carrying Interstate Highway 35 West over the Mississippi River, just east of downtown Minneapolis, collapsed within a matter of seconds, claiming 13 lives and injuring 100 people. The bridge was located at the west end of our campus of the University of Minnesota in the neighborhood where many of our students live. The Minnesota Department of Transportation reports that the bridge carried 140 vehicles per day. Rerouting of the large volume of commuter and commercial traffic is co currently costing the state an order of $500,000 per day. The collapse of a highway bridge in a major downtown area will certainly have tremendous consequences not only to Minnesota, but to our national society. Um, this is the I-35 double bridge before the collapse. Uh, what makes the event peculiar to engineers is that the bridge was a very typical structure and the collapse occurred at what was believed to be ordinary um, operating conditions and without any warning. The I-35W bridge was opened to traffic in 1967, 40 years ago. The spans over the Mississippi River were constructed as a steel truss bridge. A steel truss is a bridge composed of a large number of um, steel beams uh, arranged to form a series of triangles. Steel bridges are a very common form for long span bridges, not only in, in, the, in the United States, but wor worldwide. In fact, there are at least four other similar bridges in Minnesota, including this bridge in the city of St. Cloud. This is uh, 60 miles to the north of Minneapolis. The St. Cloud Bridge is a very similar three-span truss bridge constructed 10 years earlier and roughly half the size of the I-35W bridge. The George Washington Memorial Bridge in Seattle, Washington is another example of a steel truss bridge. This bridge was constructed 35 years earlier than the I-35W bridge is, and is also uh, quite uh, larger. Until the current event occurred, steel truss bridges were, had, the, had earned the reputation of being quite economical and reliable. Because the I-35W bridge was constructed 40 years er ago, it did include uh, many old designs and technology which are no longer in use. Despite such shortcomings, the mandated maintenance procedures were expected to ensure that the I-35W bridge was safe and reliable. The I-35W bridge was a three-span um, bridge spanning across the north and south shores of the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River ran through the, the longest um, central span of the bridge, which was 556 feet long. The bridge was composed of the main trusses, the floor trusses, and a concrete slab system. The concrete slab was supported by floor trusses, um, shown here in pink. The floor trusses um, were placed perpendicular to the roadway. The floor trusses were supported by two main, main trusses, which were placed at the two edges of the roadway. The main trusses, in turn, um, were sitting on concrete piers. My colleagues at the University of Minnesota studied the bridge in the past. The primary concern of, the, of that research was to evaluate the danger of what is known as fatigue. <coughs> 
cracking due to metal fatigue is an important concern because bridges are loaded thousands of times every day by traffic. The occurrence of fatigue depends on the design of the bridge and the, the force level introduced in the, in the truss members by each um, heavy vehicle. Bridge codes specify a threshold level, uh, a threshold force level beneath which fatigue may not be a concern. Therefore, bridges today are designed and maintained to remain safe against fatigue effects. Now, the main truss of the I-35 bridge comprised of square beams, such as this one. The, a problem was that in, in the fabrication process, these small um, steel tabs were welded, and such detail is known to be a poor fatigue design. Another concern was that these small steel tabs were placed in the inside of the, of the beams, therefore making any crack happening around these steel tabs very difficult to, uh, to detect upon visual inspection. The floor trusses did not have the same problem as the main trusses. The floor trusses are the ones indicated in pink, the smaller trusses. However, the floor trusses had poor detailing at locations where the beams joined together, such as here. The small plates um, seen in the middle of the members are also known to be poor fatigue design. My colleagues investigated the forces introduced to the truss um, by traffic and concluded that the forces were sufficiently small so that cracking due to fatigue is not an immediate problem. The research report suggested and recommended continuing regular inspection of critical locations, such as this joint, where fatigue can be a potential problem. Um, six weeks after the tragedy, the cause of the, the bridge collapse is still not fully understood. The National Transportation Safety Board has been conducting a thorough investigation. Now, the University of Minnesota has been awarded a grant from NSF to in initiate its own study of the bridge. A widely publicized video clip and the way fallen pieces are distributed suggest that the collapse initiated at the south side of the bridge, at the left end of this photograph, followed by the main span following straight down, and at the end, the north span tilted over. However, we have limited clues on the most important phase of the bridge collapse. Numerous speculations have been made by experts on the cause of the bridge collapse. As I mentioned previously, fatigue is believed not to have been a very serious concern for this bridge. Another suspected cause, which was announced by the NTSB, was a potential poor design of the gusset plates. The gusset plates are plates through which um, beams are connected together. Um, in this photograph, the gusset plate is this plate uh, marked by graffiti. <clears throat> At the time of the collapse, minor repair work were underway on the concrete slab. It is not clear what effect the construction had on the bridge collapse. Uh, this photograph shows some equipments and vehicles that are used for pavement repair. Some people speculate that concentration of such construction vehicles and materials um, on the bridge may have caused overstress on the bridge. Steel beams in immediately underneath the concrete slab were corroded. The de-icing agents used for winter traffic are we know accelerate corrosion and rusting of steel. While many observations, um, as I went through, point to the deficiency of the bridge, it is hard to believe that any one of these deficiencies could have caused the collapse that happened. The research community is very interested in inv investigating the cause of the collapse. We feel a very strong obligation to prevent future occurrence of such tragedy and to convey the lessons learned. 
I have no doubt that the NTSB will complete a very successful investigation with or without help from the research community. Nonetheless, the, an academic investigation is needed to ensure that all possible lessons that can be learned from this tragedy are identified and disseminated widely. Another uh, one example of help that the research community might be able to provide are the, the, the experimental facilities. Um, this slide shows a major testing facility that the University of Minnesota houses. This facility is part of um, the NSF NIS program. Uh, NIS stands for the George E. Brown Jr. Network for Earthquake Engineering Simulation. This facility could potentially be used to further understand how strong the bridge was and how the bridge may have collapsed. In conclusion, the collapse of the I-35W bridge was unfortunate and an unexpected tragedy. While speculation points to fatigue cracking, poor design, overloading, and corrosion, among other factors, there seems to be no clear-cut answer at this point to the cause of the collapse. Engineers must identify the cause of the collapse of the I-35W bridge and assure that the lessons learned will be used to significantly reduce the risk of such tragedy in the future. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Outstanding, thank you very much. Uh, finally, we're going to have a, a, a talk by, and there will be an opportunity for questions uh, uh, after the third talk. Uh, at that time, uh, just in case you start lining up early, um, we're all going to use the microphone. I won't take questions from the floor. I'll only take it from the microphone. So you can use that as a hint if you like. Uh, finally, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Antonio Nani. I know him as Tony, and I've known him a long time, actually. Uh, he's currently professor and chair of civil, architectural, and environmental engineering at the University of Miami. He also directs one of our, one of NSF's industry, university, uh, cooperative research centers in the area of repair of buildings and bridges with composite materials. Today, Dr. Nanny was going to talk to us about how this kind of technology might help us avert these kinds of future disasters. Tony? Thank you. Well, thank you, Mike. Thanks, everyone, for being here. When I was invited, obviously, I could not say no. There was a very good reason, being the third when I have the last word. The only drawback was in the fact that uh, we only have 10 minutes, and uh, maybe I'll keep you here a little longer. No, I'm just joking. Um, the, as Mike indicated, uh, my uh, job this afternoon is to spend this 10 minutes in talking about uh, three major points, and this is the only slide with text in it. The others only will have pictures. I really would like to stress uh, what, in a sense, my colleagues uh, Richard and Taichir have already mentioned, perhaps with a slightly different spin. The first one that for repair and maintenance, we need a paradigm shift. Um, we have indicated already that there is the need for funding, there is a need for money. Without money, we cannot do anything. But it's not just only money. And the subtitle, in a sense, uh, speaks to that issue. Uh, in order to be able to become agents of change, we need to understand the boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions are, again, more than money. And I'll get to that point. For repair and maintenance, we need to change a culture. And I'll speak to that issue. For material innovation and innovative technologies, again, we need to change a culture. We need to have the ability to implement uh, these technologies. And the third point I want to make is related to the technologies that we have available today that can really be a quantum leap in terms of uh, uh, the way that we deal today with the built infrastructure. 
Um, the first slide is similar to what Richard has just shown. And I'm going to take a different spin on this and say, if you were to show this to a high school student, do you think that that student would be very excited about doing engineering at a university environment? Most likely not. So in addition to money, we need to entice young minds to come to programs such as this that deal with the maintenance of the infrastructure. Speaking to the issue of maintenance might not be very fashionable, but if we put maintenance in light of sustainability and we talk about uh, the infrastructure as a portion of the environment, then I think the attitude of uh, uh, the potential student will change. Uh, this is the similar situation. This is uh, the deterioration of uh, a deck uh, in a bridge that was replaced just last year. I'll show you some other slides related to this very bridge. Again, the same point. How come today we have not uh, develop technology to address these issues. We go to the moon, but we cannot fix the problem of corrosion. Well, there could be a reason. There is uh, potential drawbacks and challenges that we need to overcome in order to implement new technology. Education happens in various ways. It's obviously in the classroom. It's in the laboratory. It deals with the existing workforce, like the picture at the very top indicates but it also relates to technology transfer in the field with the people who are doing the simple jobs. One of the things that you might realize if you are in the business of construction, but you might not if you are in a different discipline, is that we are regulated by building codes. The building codes are extremely necessary and important, but they are based on proven technologies. And by default, in a sense, they prevent the implementation of innovation. In order to minimize risk, again, we need to use state-of-the-art knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so on one side, they are a blessing. On the other side, they are a curse. The other thing that I would like to point out, uh, not just only related to the bridge infrastructure, but in general, the entire built infrastructure, we have building codes that deal with new construction. We do not have building codes that deal with repair and rehabilitation. The only agency that has made a statement towards the creation of a new code for repair and rehabilitation is the American Concrete Institute, and we hope to have one by 2011. So again, you can see the difference between new construction and repair and rehabilitation and the need uh, for a new culture. The slide again was already shown by Richard, but I take a slightly different spin here. Even though we put more money, even though we do things better because we have new materials, we have uh, uh, new capabilities in terms of analysis and design, still the gap between the inventory and the deficient bridges, in this case, will not be uh, uh, reaching a, a, a point of zero for the red line. And unless we have the implementation of new technologies available in the next few years, uh, this would be like saying, in the case of energy, uh, we build more cars and we pump more fuel. You are not going to fill this gap. Um, the opportunity to speak about some of the work that we have done over the years, as just as an example, and here is not to say that it's the best or the worst, it's just an idea of what work is going on in academia as well as in industry. I'm going to speak next uh, about the issue of composite materials. I've brought with me some examples of technology that we have developed over the years, uh, both with the help of uh, NSF, as indicated by Mike, uh, the center that we run, that we have had now for eight years, that focuses on the use of composites in repair and rehabilitation, but also with funding uh, through the US DOT uh, University Transportation Center program. So those have been uh, extremely helpful. And I think the focus of those centers uh, that deals with the that deal with the uh, relationship between industry and academia has been the one that has allowed us um, uh, some of the successes that hopefully I will show you. These are some of the examples, and maybe during the uh, question and answer um, uh, session, uh, you might be able to ask. Uh, uh, the, the technology of uh, externally bonded composites 
have gone uh, beyond uh, the lab uh, experimentation. What I want to show in the slides is that we have run tests in the field. We have uh, adhered these materials to bridges. We have tested the bridges to failure. And we have demonstrated that they, they do work. Again, unfortunately, we don't have it yet uh, in, in codes. After we have demonstrated this in, a, in some of the bridges, we have been able to implement the technology, but not on the iconic bridges. These are the farm-to-market bridges. These are the bridges that are in rural America that obviously represents a lower level of risk, but still are key to uh, the economy and the social welfare. In some instances, we have been able to use this technology for more relevant structures, like this uh, uh, interstate bridge, because the need for the owner here was extremely impelling. Is the case of a, a girder impacted by a vehicle, as you can see, fairly extensive damage, but really localized. The only economical way to fix this problem was with wrapping with composites. And you can see here the students and the DOT personnel uh, repairing the bridge according to this technology. It's there, has been demonstrated, but is not quite yet in the code. This is another attempt to uh, develop uh, uh, composites for the infrastructure that take a different twist. They do not require the uh, repair and rehabilitation of the parent structure. This is particularly done for uh, farm-to-market bridges, off-system bridges in rural areas, where we need to extend the life of the structure and minimizing the cost uh, of the repair. There is work being done by uh, colleagues, for example, at NC State, our uh, twin uh, uh, university in terms of uh, uh, the uh, Industry University CRC, uh, done on steel structures with the same technology, the same idea, uh, being constructible but at the same time being durable with the repair that you propose. This is one of my favorite slides this afternoon to talk to the issue of composites for both uh, uh, repair rehabilitation, as you can see in this bridge in Florida where the bridge was converted to a fish pier and the cantilever portion of the bridge strengthened to carry the weight of uh, the fishermen uh, using the composites inserted in slots cut into the concrete. But more importantly, with the same idea, uh, look at this bridge deck. It's being built without a pound of steel. Now, many people would argue today that there is really no need for putting internal reinforcement in a bridge deck. And if you could do that, then you obviously would avoid all the problems related to corrosion. And not only in the bridge deck, the same thing could be done in the parapets. Um, this is a further evolution of the concept of uh, uh, removing some of the steel in the parts that are less critical in a bridge structure. In this case, the bridge deck is built with composites that also take along uh, um, the, uh, the formwork. In other words, when you pour the concrete on top of this deck, not only you have the reinforcement, what you see in yellow, but you have the formwork underneath it. So you obtain two results with one effort. You make the structure light and durable, but at the same time you make the reconstruction, in this case, uh, much faster. Uh, then you can go to the extreme. You can remove the steel and the concrete altogether and go in what we call uh, fully composite bridges. And uh, uh, this, uh, uh, for example, is a segment of the bridge that you see here, obviously a very short span bridge, made with the, uh, the type of composite that you probably see more in the aerospace industry that you see in the infrastructure. Now I'm switching here to the third and final topic, and I hope I've made the point with the change in culture, the innovative materials, and now we go to the area of uh, sensors. Uh, this is where I really believe that we can make a quantum leap without having to deal with barriers such as the code. We're not impacting the way practice is being carried out today. We just provide the engineering community with better and more tools to understand the performance of a structure. In this case, again, I'm using examples that belong to our experience and simply as examples, not just to say that they are the best. Uh, in this case, a, a contractor, while building this bridge, drops a girder. The girder is bent out of shape. 
and obviously there is a problem of reutilizing that girder. Well, we came on board, we instrumented this girder with fiber optics in this case, and we were able to demonstrate that the girder could function. Not only that, but two years, three years after the construction of this bridge, you can collect still a wealth of data that help you not only in understanding the performance of the bridge, but doing what we call prognosis of the bridge. Almost like when you take your vehicle uh, to a, to, for a change of oil, you get a sense of what the vehicle has. Well, we can do the same thing for a bridge. Obviously, this is a more complex situation, but the tools are there, and there is really no barriers for the implementation of this technology. This is another um, item that we have developed, and there is many others uh, around the country and around the world. We happen to call this smart brick. We don't have much fantasy in my business. I guess this looks like a brick, right? But we attach it, for example, in this case, to a pier of a bridge to measure the scour uh, at the foundation of, uh, of the spear. Uh, this is a device that has a battery that can last uh, seven years because intelligently the device goes on and off. Uh, and it can communicate with cell phones or whatever you want. We developed this through the NSF IUCRC a couple of years ago, really to solve the problem of flash floods in uh, rural bridges, to make sure that the bridge covered with water would not be uh, really used by, by the public. So again, there is technology out there that can help us dramatically in uh, collecting information and making the right evaluation on the state of our bridges. Uh, this final slide on the issue of uh, sensors deals with the issue, for example, of lasers. Not only you can use them for the obvious reason of monitoring deflection of bridges with uh, uh, these devices, but for example, in even in more creative fashion. This is another uh, spin-off of our work, uh, is a device that allows you to measure in a quantitative way the roughness of a surface. And this is very important for repair rehabilitation or even for repainting. So again, in the area of sensors, the potential is extraordinary because we are not really impacting issues related to safety where the uh, uh, problems associated with the existence of codes uh, is really a barrier to innovation. Uh, my last slide is, in a sense, a summary slide. And if I were to express this in word, I would say it's all about people. Of course, you need the money. But if you don't have the education, if you don't have the changing culture, if you don't have the interest in working with the infrastructure, we're not going to solve these problems. Thanks.